right? Now you do a half bow. And then do Changui, which is one knee, you kneel on one knee. Just strike. Palms together. <coughs> and then you say, I'll give, yeah, perfect. Gong Ching. Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Namo sadanto suche doye alahadi sammeao san putoshe. Namo sadanto suche doye alahadi sammeao san putoshe. Okay, can we do this together? Wu shang shen shen wei miao. Oh, too fast, too fast. Together doesn't mean racing. You have to listen, remember? We're doing it together. This is reading together. Here we go. Wu shang shen shen. Wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan zao yu wo jin jian wan de shou chi yuan jie ru lai zhen shi yi much nicer here we go supreme and wondrous dharma subtle and profound rarely is encountered even in a million eons but now we see and hear it and accept it reverently, may we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Well done. And you just stand up, do a half bow, and you're done. Good. Every night we can have different people request Dharma. If you choose to, that would be nice. This morning we began our story of the Six Patriarchs as he was telling it. He was giving us a flashback to uh, his, you could say, his causes and conditions to becoming the Sixth Patriarch. And it had to do with his encounter with the Fifth Patriarch. And I pointed out the fact that he talked back, didn't he? That's important to pay attention to, because that's consistent with his character as a teacher and as a person. And it's also characteristic of our teacher and the way he taught, taught us. He didn't say, oh, you're young, you be quiet. He didn't say that. He didn't say, oh, you're a woman, you're not allowed to speak. You have no opinion, right? You just agree with everyone or you don't even think. He didn't say anything like that. He didn't say, oh, let's let the senior monk's opinion be everybody's opinion. No one dares disagree, right? Never said that. What did he say? He didn't even say, agree with the sutra. The sutra is 100% right and just memorize it and you're good. He didn't say that. What he did say was, if somebody who portrays themselves as the Buddha shows up and the things they say make no sense, don't accept it. Challenge it. 
challenge even the Buddha if they don't speak wisely. What do you take as criteria? Wisdom. Wisdom. And how do you know it's wisdom? Well, does it accord with true principle? And where do you look to find the standard of true principle? The answer is in your mind. That's where you look. That is the ultimate judge. But we have help along the way, which is our good and wise friends, our Dharma teachers, our community, the Sangha, people who have gone before who have found that principle to be good and valuable and wise and harmless. And when you cultivate according to it, you get good results. That's the criteria. And if that's your standard for what's true and what's real, what that requires you to do is stay alert. You gotta think. In this Dharma, you have to think. You have to use your own best experience, your own best judgment all the time. There are he would say there are no fixed dharmas. Okay? Which to me that really appeals to me as an American who's you know born in the twentieth century and was raised in a time of uh, bumper stickers that said question authority. Right? Don't take it on somebody else's word. That really appeals to me. Uh, this is not dogmatic teaching. Oh, well, they say it's so, so swallow it. Right? Question is, who says it's so? Why would I swallow it if it's not true and good and helpful and, you know, leads to goodness. Okay, so that's our background. And that's as we uh, continue through the text, we're going to discover that that is, that Matt, the Sixth Patriarch is consistent throughout with that attitude. Okay, here we go. The other thing that we said this morning was um, everything that we know about religion is a story. It's a story that we heard from somebody we trusted. They said it was so, and there was nobody else saying, oh, but you know, that's just a story. Let's put that into context. We didn't hear that mostly. I heard uh, that I, I was raised Protestant, and so I heard a lot about Jesus. And that was good, that was fine. Nobody said anything different about Jesus. And so I didn't hear any other story until I met the Sixth Patriarch Sutra. And particularly Master Xuanhua, whose life embodied what the Sixth Patriarch taught. Shifu was a pilgrim, a pioneer, a reformer of orthodoxy in Buddhism and Confucianism. So Shurfu was very hard on his own tradition. He found lots of problems with the way the institution of Chinese Buddhism grew and developed. And he said, we're not going to be teaching you Chinese Buddhism. I was interested in that sent sentence. He said, get this straight. I am not teaching you Chinese Buddhism. But then he didn't stop there. He said, and I'm not teaching you Indian Buddhism. And I'm not teaching you Cambodian, Laotian, Thai, Sri Lankan, Japanese, Korean, Malaysian, or Singaporean Buddhism either. <laughs> that I am teaching you your nature. I'm teaching you the mind, the mind ground. So our tradition is the Xin Di Baba, the, the Dharma that comes from the mind. And that itself was not a set of teachings. It was learning. Huo Dao Lao, Xue Dao Lao. We live a long time, we study and learn as long as we live. Lifelong learning. That's our tradition. Master Hua organized a free school at age 16 and was the teacher. Took on all the teaching because his, his fellow farming community kids didn't have money to hire a tutor, so he was the teacher. Um, he himself was trained in a tradition that went back thousands of years, the uh, traditional style of memorization. I, we talked about memorizing the Zhang Dao Go. We heard him reciting this afternoon. And 
that had roots. Uh, Huang Youwei and others, Wang Fengyi, created something called the Wang Guo Dao De Hui, the International Virtue Society. Master Hua was big in that. And after this, after Min Guo was established after 1911, the, the, the imperial tradition, the tradition of Chinese emperors, ended in 1911. And a lot of that education went, went away. Uh, there was a great criticism of Chinese culture as being law ho, being backward. It was called Yajou Bingfu, the sick man of Asia, sick country of Asia. And so the answer was, we got to grab science as soon as we can, grab science and modernize. So that put an end to this style of learning. But Sherpa was the last generation to memorize the classics. And so he taught us. Is that me? I know, who's chanting? Somebody Is that a cell phone? That's a ringtone. Either that or Amitabha's on the phone. Who knows? <laughs> wow. Better answer. Quick. Wait, wait. Amitabha, Amitabha. Sure, 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 Amitabha. That's a great ringtone. Okay, so Master Hua uh, used what he knew to as his standard for education. And we have done a lot with our boys and girls school based on that style. Right? Here he is teaching. In this case, he had just written an essay and was explaining it at Gold Mountain. So this is our teacher. Here he is matching couplets, tui, tui lian putting up the first line and having everybody match it down the second line. So if um, religious communities be, often have a way that they enter society beyond their own practices, it's called a ministry. What's your ministry? How do you minister to people? Ours is definitely education, as well as translation and publication and all. But education is the ministry of DRBA. Um, this is, I'm going to go right past this. Um, Buddhism in the West will probably emphasize the fact that we're science friendly. We understand psychology from the mind ground. We are not people in the center. We are living beings and the mind in the center. We are not male strong. We are gender free. The idea is all living beings have a mind. And when you ask about uh, Buddhism's ecological environmental stance, Indra's net, where the smallest reflects the largest, interpenetrating without obstruction. All right, so this is another, that's a lecture for another time. Um, we, just, we can show you the slides just if you want to see them. So this was a lecture that I that, uh, was prepared for someone else. We're going to go right to another piece of it. Science friendly. Cultivation, our spiritual search, you can test it. It's been tested. Testable. You don't have to take it on faith. Number two, psychologically oriented. The Buddha investigated his mind deep and left a paper trail called the sutras to what he discovered. Okay. Um, Buddhism is egalitarian. Men and women alike can cultivate to success. It's not determined by your gender, how far you can go. It's determined by how hard you work. That's nice. That's important. That's how the Dharma is going to come into the West. Right? Caste is not important. Surname is not important. Wealth is not important. Status, gender, race, species, not important to your cultivation of the way. What matters is how effectively you remove the ignorance that covers your mind. That's the deal, which I like. That really appeals to me. It's not that you're, because you're, your dad was somebody important, therefore you're further ahead in the religion. Buddhism furthermore redefines masculinity. And that's, this is half of our room, but it's an important half. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Oop, that's misspelled. 
to me. Nobody saw my typo there. There we go. Don't take it from the monk either. Question authority. Sorry, Master, your spelling is for bonkers. Okay, fourth aspect. Buddhism is not humans in the center when it comes to the world. It takes the mind and living beings as its center. Our environmental view brings life back to nature. They say even a tiny particle of dust has Buddhas in it. That's out there, that's esoteric. But at the very least, we let all species live their lives without looking at them as food. Okay, there we go. More about this. And I had to correct it today because when I gave this talk, it was ORG, not EDU. Happily, we're now accredited. So, more about that. Find out. Okay, look at the stories we've absorbed. Now, this is not just for people who are what are called converts, religious converts. They're Used to be something else, and now they're interested in Buddhism. This is people who grew up in a Buddhist world, but maybe didn't pick up on it. Or were told, or, have you ever seen moms bring their kids into the monastery and push their heads down on the floor? Bow, boom, boom, right? Pushing the kid down, boom, bow, bow to the monk, boom. The kid's like, I don't want to mind. Oh. You know, and so you, were learn, you learned that Buddhism involves mom pushing your head to the ground, you know. There's a lesson for you, you know. Oh boy, that's a story, you know. And so your first impression of Buddhism might have been, you know, forceful, compulsory. But the stories we learn, we absorb through our skin just living in the culture. Uh, people say that the Holy Bible influences the West through the air through your feet, through the water, through the bread, through the food, through the wine, you know. You can't avoid, and Buddhism in China, China, uh, like, is thoroughly, China has had Buddhism in its worldview for thousands of years. You just can't avoid it. So, the value of coming up here to the mountaintop is we are sitting together, focusing on these basic ideas, and we can look at them deeper. It's a safe environment here to think thoroughly about the lessons we have learned about the, the, the religion, the faith, the practices, the spirituality that we've learned. And what does that mean about me? Who am I? Who am I as a result of all these stories that we've absorbed? Okay? So, authorities tell us this is true. Okay, here we are in Buddha Root Farm. We can ask ourselves, oh yeah? I'm not so sure. Or show me. If we're feeling particularly aggressive, we could say, prove it. Right? Prove it. You say it's so. Well, you don't have to be so hard on it. You could say, well, tell me why. I, I want to know more. I, I'm interested, but I need to be shown before I'm going to believe it. I'm not going to give you my belief until you make it clear to me. Saying, do so because I say so is not good enough. Not good enough. Okay? Power holders. Ooh. People who, you know, uh, it comes to mind the religious right who tell you God, is, God wants this candidate elected. You know, oh ye, you know, gee whiz. That's the Holy Roman Emperor combined political power and religious power. He could put you in jail and send you to hell in the same in the same sentence. You know, that's in America. Luckily, we have church and state separate. So that's another story. We won't go there right now. But power holders can often determine the story that's told. Ooh, you can't tell that story here. We'll bust you. We will silence you. Okay. Um, I want to tell a personal story here. I was in Calgary at, at uh, Avatamska Monastery, and Master Hua was giving me a teaching which often involved uh, correcting his disciples, especially his left-home disciples. Um, he was scolding me, and I, was, I had my head on the ground, and I said, I'm sorry, sir, what I mean to 
and I realized he was not scolding me anymore. And so I looked up at him, and he was looking at me with his head to one side and a smile on his face like this. He said, how long have you been a monk? I said, sure, about 10 years. He said, 10 years? Hmm, I don't think you've taken the first step into the Buddha's door. He said, you still think the Buddha is a cop waiting to bust you if he catches you breaking the precept. Am I right? And my jaw hit the floor because he was right. I had built the Buddha in my mind on an Old Testament God's body with a long beard, sitting on a throne, looking kind of pissed off, you know, looking hmm, like that. What occurred to me was we don't change the stories we learn first that easily. I was raised as a Christian, in a, not Catholic, but a Protestant, and I still had this view of God as a male figure who was very much like a judge, like a cop, and my job was to try to get over on him, hoping he wasn't noticing that I was not following his commandments. And if I got away with it, I was free, right? So I had... Although I had been a Buddhist monk, not just a Buddhist believer, but a Buddhist monk for 10 years, I hadn't really shifted that view very deeply. I'd put a Buddhist face on an Old Testament body, so I was halfway there. But he said, Master Hua said, I had, vision, I had put the Buddhist face on an Old Testament god. Shifu said, this is kind of how I saw the Buddha, kind of, you know, this is Renaissance visions of God, right? Pretty powerful male figure out there, right? Thou shalt not, right? And what did Master Hua say? He said, you still don't understand how compassionate the Buddha really is. He's on your side. He's just waiting for you to wake up. And that's the sign of a good teacher who can take you that next step past where you could go yourself. He gave me a little push, and it was like, and sure enough, I guess I was ready, and the teacher knew when. I challenged my own understanding of what the precept. I had put the power and the precepts outside me. I had made the Buddha into this figure who was going to either let me come to heaven or nirvana or punish me and send me to hell. A lot like the story of the Christian God, or the, the God of the Hebrews, actually, Yahweh. And I hadn't taken the next step into the Buddhist view, which is zi zuo zi shou. The deeds you do bring the harvest you get. You harvest what you plant. As you reap, as you sow, so shall you reap, says the Old Testament. Plant corn, you get corn. Plant potatoes, you get potatoes. Cultivate apples, you get apples. It's not the case that you plant corn and get apples, or that I plant corn and you get corn. It's not, right? It's that you get what you har what you you harvest what you plant because why cause and effect is true in our tradition as it is interestingly in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament but there are other stories there so here is a good teacher showing me that I had not shifted my stories yet completely isn't that interesting boy what a shock to somebody my pilgrimage was long behind me right but I was still in terms of who's the Buddha who is the power holder, I was not ready to accept. He said, you still think the Buddha is a cop waiting to bust you if he catches you breaking the precepts. You don't recognize how compassionate the Buddha really is. He's on your side. He's just waiting for you to wake up. Wow. That was news to me. Okay. So how powerful are the first stories we hear? 
if we, at some point, challenge a story or reject a story, is it possible to learn and embrace another story or valuable? That's an interesting question, isn't it? So let's say, how about people who are not religious at all? You didn't have the benefits of a Catholic, Roman Catholic upbringing. Maybe you were scientific. Maybe your parents were skeptical, never took you to church. Right? You never saw Jesus on the cross. And I need to say, especially because Graciela's mom is here, and she is a deeply devout Catholic. And the first time she came to the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, let's see, not the first time, the second time she came, she said to her daughter Graciela, you know, I like him. He's like Father who? Who was Father Orozco. And I thought, all right. I'm, if I can make you think of Father Orozco, I'm doing good, right? So this is, we're, we're, we're going deep tonight, so hang, fasten your seatbelt here. So, but I think I much prefer being with my Catholic friends who have deep faith in Catholicism to my Buddhist friends who aren't clear what they believe at all, who just kind of swallow the story, you know, and don't think about it. So... Better to have some deeply held faith with conviction than to have no faith or confusion like me was. So the question is, suppose you were raised by many, many young people today never see the inside of a church at all, or a monastery, or a mosque, or a synagogue, right? What do they see? Video games. Boom, boom, boom. What do they see? You know, computers, TV, pornography, right? They don't get any story whatsoever. Or the story is, uh, what's the hot video game? Fortnite. Fortnite. The they story of Fortnite, which is great. You can just keep writing it. It's fresh every time, and you do it with a team. And Okay, that's a story. My point is we are hungry for stories. Our minds deeply, deeply want to know what is right and what is wrong. We need that. It's like vitamins in the air. What's right and what is wrong? Question over there. Is that Spike? I can't see. Oh, that's in the shirt in the shadows. Omar? Hey, Omar. Can, can you, would you stand up? If you're in the shadows over there, I can't see your face. There you go. Hey, all right. Yeah. Whack. Yeah. You bet. Thank you for that comment. Okay. Let's move forth further. Does the theology influence the culture? That's a don't wait wait for this question. Let me unpack that. As above, so below. True. The stories we hear about who's in charge deeply influence the way we think about our lives, about our families, about the police, the power holders, about your brother, your sister, younger sister. Because why? The story comes down. Okay. Look at male roles in Western religious institutions. Omar's comment. Look at this. Patriarchal, rigid defenders of orthodoxy. Female deity? Not yet. Female president? Never Hillary, right? Oh, not yet. Women clergy? Well, we have three bhikshunis and three bhikshus. We're doing good. Right? Not yet in uh, Catholicism, for example. But male, dominant, patriarchal is really true. So what do we do? Suppose you say, hey, I don't respond to that story. What are your choices? Do you accept the story and just submit? Do you stay in there and doubt it? Your, your kosher, your sin fei, right? Your mouth says yes, your heart says no. Or do you leave? Wow. Number one, choice. This is truth. I accept it. I surrender to its authority. I know it's true because somebody in power told me so. 
I know it's true because I went to Zhongwen Shui Xiao and they said so, right? Number two, you stay, your body's there, but your mind is split. Who says that's true? Or three, oh boy, you reject it and you leave. You say, what they're saying is not, in, is not true in my experience. That denies my reality, so I'm gone. What price do you pay for choice number three? Man, oh man. If you leave the church, if you leave your cultural identity, you become what's called an outcast. You have no refuge. You have no home. You have no compass, no identity, no salvation in the future. You've got no ethical code, no way to know what's right or wrong. If you leave uh, the traditional orthodox story, so that's risky. And what happens when the church that you've been part of kind of doesn't, doesn't seem suitable anymore? The number one, the number two Catholic country in Europe was Ireland. Poland was number one, Ireland was number two. The Catholic Church in Ireland has run into a lot of problems in the last 30 years, and the attendance in Roman Catholic Church in Ireland has just gone. As a result, there's all these people who are lost spiritually, and even their identity. They don't know where to go. Interestingly enough, mindfulness is huge in Ireland right now. People are going to meditation to find out. Okay, suppose you take number three. You become an outlaw. You become an alienated loner. You become a seeker or a drifter. You become a macho person. You become a cowboy, a gangster, a super spy. This is the history of the, 21st, the second half of the 21st century after the Second World War. Okay, my father's generation, what happened? People went to war and saw horror. They saw the world turn upside down. They saw human beings do things that their, imag their worst imagination couldn't imagine, you know, concentration camps and all. And they thought, you know, God has forgotten us. God has abandoned us, or God is dead. That was where that came from. Either that, or you never grow up. You become cynical, you reject God's kindness and compassion, or you become the 40-year-old adolescent, right? So, one of the issues is the promise of heaven above, but a world and a life that makes no sense to you. So what do you do? You feel lost. You are, we are searching for the road home to find the dad who is not listening to us. Either that or dad has a funny sense of humor. He threw the Second World War for a party, right? We're looking for security. Where am I, sa where am I safe? Where do I belong? Where is meaning? Looking for home. You find it in fellow seekers, gang members. Look at these unhappy male children. See anybody who's strong? See anybody who's confident in their identity? Or are they rejecting everything internal and externalizing Hardness, don't mess with me because I'm lost. Hell's angels says it all, right? We've been through hell and back in the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, Iraq number one, Iraq number two, and Afghanistan. PTSD. In Australia, we've started a new group at, at Gold Coast Armor Realm for returned. Australian vets, in 100 returned Australian vets, two were injured or killed in acts of violence, 25 committed suicide, right? It's called PTSD. In my dad's generation, it was called shell shock. They didn't even have post-traumatic stress disorder, but it's so prevalent now in Australia, and you know the U.S. is the same, Europe is the same, that the number one source of harm 
in return vets his self-harm, kill themselves. One out of four. What's going on? Big problem there. Okay, it's because there's something basically wrong. Suppose you leave the church. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I admired rebels, outlaws, violent male anti-heroes. Who were the male model, the male role models of the 60s and 70s? 007, Shaft, one bad mother Fletcher, right? The Duke, John Wayne. Steve McQueen, The Great Escape. You have to be a certain age. Pip, is this, was this your world? David Harris, yes. The John, Joan Baez's husband. You bet, David Harris. Great name, I, should add, I'll, I will add that. Freedom meant disobey rules unless they suited you. Indulge your desires immediately, no thought for consequences. If it feels good, do it again. Ernest Hemingway, for whom the bell tolls. The power of framing a story. Okay, we're going to go right past this here. I was searching for my tribal myth because I didn't identify with the values I met. Think of Omar's comment. I didn't identify with the masculine roles the culture provided. Do I know my own roots, my own founding myths? Have I ever listened to my elders talk about where my surname came from? Do I have a tradition or a culture that I am proud of? Or am I confused because why? My parents were immigrants. They were new in this land. They uprooted and rerooted, and I don't know who to identify with, the dominant culture or my own language. Right? What about that? That's the story for many, many, many of us. This is not a land of, uh, we are not native here. Only Native Americans are native here. Do I know my mother's mother's language? That's interesting, isn't it? Myth, mythos, speech, thought, story. Don't know quite, that's Greek. Myth doesn't mean an old made up legend. It means the founding story of our tribe, the ongoing narrative, the carrier of values. That's myth. That's why we want to investigate story and we're listening to the sixth patriarch tell a story. What are the consequences of the stories that we learn? Well, the laws of our country are rooted in those stories. Our relationships are rooted in those stories. Our psyches, our minds, our contracts, the structures, we learn where safety is and who's got the power. Okay, a lot of marriage has to do with transfer of property, right? Not love. Love is a recent thing. Marriage before was always about which women, what woman we bring into our, under our roof because her children are going to determine who gets the land, right? A lot, a lot. That's how the, the contracts were written. Now, the question is, are all stories equally true? Does this myth carry meaning for you? If you question the story, can you still stand? You still know who you are? Do you still exist if you leave the story behind? Okay, are all stories equally valid? Do I have a choice? Who empowers me to use wisdom and to choose for myself? That's why we come to Buddha Root Farm to kind of knock on this door, poke around in the basement of my understanding. Can I question and stay in the culture? What is this? This is a rite of passage, a bar mitzvah. 13 years old, the Jewish boy gets to recite for his elders a passage from the Torah in Hebrew correctly. And if he does it right, this proud mom is going to have another man in the family at age 13. It's called a rite of passage. These are Maasai boys just in their teens, who are being taken out on their hunt. And do they look happy? Do they look peaceful? They look scared to death, don't they? Right? They have to go out and prove their worth by symbolically killing 
uh, a lion proving their courage, that's called a rite of passage. Okay? What is our rite of passage? You become a fully powered member of the society when you get your first smartphone. Because you can go online and be a troll and say the meanest, nasty, nobody knows you're 14. You know. How about that? We don't have any rites of passage. For women, it's not so clear. Beauty is one standard of womanhood. First makeup, mm. first prom, going steady with that ring around your finger with a lot of fuzzy yarn on it because the, the, the uh, class ring is too big. Remember, going steady? Nobody does. Oh, well. Who sets the standard? Who tells the stories? Okay. Wait a minute. We got to let you hear this. Oh, boy. Wait a minute. Hold on. Just a moment. Yeah. Output. Jabra. Okay. Plastic surgery bling for making a mid career contestants look alike. Wow, who are these beautiful women? Only with different clothes and hairstyles. Rite of passage. Whose story do you believe? Thanks for the, the Taiwanese anime. So, um, how about that? I mean, who sets the standard? Who tells you when you're a grown up? Beauty is a standard, I guess, unless you say, no, that's not my story. That's not my standard. I don't, I don't live there. There are deeper ways to find out who I am. Okay, what about the 1% in the marketplace? Do we believe that making money is doing God's work? I grew up with that one. In my church, my Methodist church, the richest people were the ushers. That, that was how they proved their closeness to God. Commerce was holy action. God liked you more if you made more money. After 9-11, what did our president tell us? Prove you're an American by going shopping. George W. Bush said that. So there we go. Okay, that's a value. Buddhism says, uh, we got an alternative story. Also rooted in its non-theos theology, right? What is it? As is the mind, so is the world. Not as above, so below. Buddhism says, what are you thinking? That's the way you're going to see the world. And look at this. Prajna Paramita is a female. That's interesting. Gnosis, Sophia, were Greek wisdom figures, also female. Interesting. So, hmm, this story. Buddhism gives an alternative to simply submitting to authority. What is what do we hear? Hui Guang Fan Zhao. Fan Wen Wen Zi Xing. Xing Cheng Wu Shang Dao. Return the light. Shine up, light up your mind. Find one, return the hearing to hear your own nature. What did the sixth patriarch say this morning? He said, purifying your nature is Bodhi. That's it. That's the work. Verify it by your own experience. If it's not your experience, don't simply repeat it. It's not true for you until you walk the path. Hold your judgment. Don't give your judgment until you know more. Say, I'm still learning. I don't know if it's true, but I'm open to learning. That's the alternative. Let me run it again. That's the alternative to submitting to authority. What does authority say? Believe me or believe the priest because whatever he says is true. Well, what if the priest is not wholesome? What if he's not somebody you want to follow? Well, the Buddhist alternative to that, listen within, verify it by your own experience. Don't judge until you learn more. I'm still learning. There's more to learn. Okay, that's fair. 
the Buddha as a male role model. Uh, I, want, I was going to show you some pictures here. Um, hold on. I wanted to show you my. Here we go. There we are. Here's how I grew up. Male role models of the '60s. Remember him? Certain age, right? We remember him. James Bond, 007. What was his mantra? Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Okay, there's two broken precepts to start with already, <laughs> right? Here's his Aston Martin, okay? And here's Shaft. No one understands him but his baby, right? He's got such little <laughs> internal wisdom that only his baby understands him. He doesn't understand himself because nobody's ever showed him how to, into, how to look within, in respect. But he will definitely kill you dead if he's told to, right? I love this one. A man's got to do what a man's got to do. Now there's wisdom for you, right? <laughs> you live by that mantra, oh my God. What do you want me to do, draw you a picture? Now, John Wayne himself was a fine human being, apparently. He's, he's, uh, people uh, say good things about him as a man, but his movie star character was the outlaw, the loner, the drifter, the self-made man, right? He was the ultimate cowboy, a result of the Second World War's uh, thought that if God's alive, he must be perverse because how could God create the horrors of that war? People were lost. This is one example of what you do. Steve McQueen, Bullet, and his famous role of the Great Escape. He could take his motorcycle over the fences. He made his motorcycle fly out of the concentration camp, right? The Great Escape. We wanted out. The world made no sense. This guy's name was Flint, in like Flint. He was a cultural hero, right? So this was, these were the male role models that I was given growing up. And you could say there are problems there, right? Now, an alternative, suppose you say, no, I don't like that tough exterior. I would prefer to make no decisions at all. Japan has a new phenomenon, post-World War II, of herbivore men. They have no interest in traditional male activities, such as making money or partnering with the opposite sex. They're not necessarily gay. They're simply nothing. Herbivore men. True phenomenon. What do they do? Lock themselves in their room. Stay online. Wait for mom to deliver soba and ramen to their door. And moms do. Right? That's interesting. Interesting phenomenon. Those guys are what? They're responding to the world they found. So, what do we do? What do we do? Buddhism gives us an alternative. And I'm presenting this. Uh, uh, way of we're, what we're doing, we're digging up the ground. I'm not giving you solutions tonight. We're just digging up the ground and saying, here's a chance to take a deep, long look at where we are today, particularly vis-a-vis -vis men, because a lot of the problem with 21st century uh, Western civilization has to do with the way we treat our boys. Jin Chuan and Jin Husher and I have been talking about this quite a lot. Because um, you look at the person in the White House, he who shall not be named, <laughs> and there's a lot to say that he's a very frustrated adolescent whose maturity, he, he was 
the the example of an adult grown-up male that he was given, he rejected. His dad it was apparently a very tough, uh, hard case kind of guy who hated everyone equally. Refused to refused to rent to black people, and uh, anybody who was not, in fact, just like him, got rejected. That's called white supremacy. And his son picked that up. And you think, well, here we are with the Buddhist alternative that says every living being has the Buddha nature. Every living being can awake. We've got an equal shot at it. The only thing that holds us back is our false thoughts and our attachments, what covers our nature. And that's a very different story than only half of one species, only the male half of humanity is acceptable if they're white like him. You know, you think, no, that's a really, really diseased view. His, can you imagine what being inside his head must be like, where everything is a threat, everything is to be rejected, except what comes to him today that he's familiar with? That's not an awakened mind, all right? But somebody like that doesn't appear out of space. He was made by the world around him. So if we can identify where that comes from, then maybe we can make a better world. So imagine the Buddha as a male role model. He's not angry. He hasn't broken off from his disciples. He's not distant and hard to reach. He is compassionate and wise. He's not waiting to bust you if he catches you breaking the precepts, but he will say, oh, oh, I bet that hurts. Uh, you want to try again? Here's a better way. If we had to say, who's the Buddha like? The Buddha's like a coach, kind of, urging you to go down the field, play better, try your best, and he'll pick you up if you fall and teach you how to do it different. The compassionate father, Tsubei the Fuqin, whose land is called utmost happiness, where suffering doesn't exist, where you can go, not just the privileged caste of certain people, right? That's interesting. Look at that view of the mind of humanity that, that is a male role model. When we find the Buddha's authority, it says, could you park that hat? It's kind of catching my eye. Yeah, thanks. It replace, replaces the need to look outside for power over people or others. You don't have to. You look inside instead. You don't have to dominate the environment. You don't have to dominate animals to survive and thrive really well. Right? That's interesting, isn't it? Now, here's a male figure, but he's not male in your face. You know, male meaning only male, not exclusive. I kind of like the groundedness and the smile, but it's not a giddy smile. He's not asking me for my approval. He's not threatening me with any kind of dominance, right? So this, this is, if you think about this as a male role model, that's an interesting alternative. This is our grand teacher, our teacher's teacher, lived to be 120. And people tell me, even though they're not Buddhists, they can dream of him. I've, I've heard of that. People say, oh, I, I, when I saw that picture on your altar, I thought, I've seen him in my dreams, but I've, I've never seen another Buddhist except you guys. But who's that? Because he comes to me. Now, that's, uh, what was he? He was married to two wives, but he made a deal with both of them that they would all stay pure because he wanted to become a monk. That's, that's an unusual confidence in gender. There we go. Some male role models. All right. So I think, let's see, is that pretty much it for, oh, okay. Here we go. Men can be both strong and kind. 
right? Strength doesn't mean you got to be hard. Women can be both nurturing and strong. Strong doesn't mean you have to be falsely hard, right? And this is deeper than the bodies we receive. Gender is just a body, and from the point of view of Buddhism, we have the current one that we're in, that we're sitting in tonight, is a result of the things we've done, the blessings we planted, the purity we have cultivated, the vows that we've made, determine our next body. I remember at Gold Mountain Monastery, uh, the monks were really hard on the nuns, that first group, and uh, Master Hua, one night the nuns came and complained, and they said, Sherpa, these bhikshus are just being totally rude to us and totally harsh. And Sherpa said, uh, he said, anybody who's hard on a bhikshuni is going to become a bhikshuni in the future. <laughs> and those who endure the insults of others become bhikshus in the future. So it's like, they went, oh, 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 oh. well, so gender is, the body we take is a result of what we do. The universe is responsive to every word we say, every act we take, every thought we think. Nothing is fixed. We're responsible for the future we create. And when I think about that, that's kind of scary because why? Theistic religions say God's in charge. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me, we say. Let go and let God, they say. And for some folks, that's a good enough story. Not everybody likes the absolute impartial freedom of the mind ground where everything we plant produces results. That's too much for a lot of people. You know, that's scary. Because why? Ultimately, we're responsible. Now, sure enough, we come with DNA from our parents. We come with you know, the gene pool, there's, we, we bring a lot to the next thought, but the next thought is ultimately free. Radical free will in Buddhism. Karma, habit, pushes us. It's like a wind, but at any point we can say, nope, I choose not to do what I'm in the habit of doing. It's easy to roll over and go back to sleep, but it takes grit and guts to say, you know, I'm going to do what's right. I know what's right, but I always like hear my conscience and I go, yeah, well, or either that or I let go and I go with my buddies. I mean, they told me it was okay, you know, or he was such a smooth talker, you know. But boy, this view says everything we do with our bodies, our mouths, and our minds makes our future. So the Sixth Patriarch says, good and wise advisors, Bodhi comes from purity of your nature. Go to work. That's it. Plant your garden. The Buddha says, follow me on a spiritual journey. There is no distance between you and the source of religious authority. You meet the Buddha in your mind. That's where the power resides. You're in charge. We're in charge. There's no difference. There's no distance between you and your mind. That's kind of scary, but it's kind of cool at the same time, right? Uh, look at this one. You begin the spiritual journey with the promise that ultimately you replace the power figure. Anybody who wants to cultivate the mind ground will become a Buddha if you keep going. That's a pretty amazing promise. The priesthood is not in authority over the laity. The sangha is not in authority over the lay people. Right? We cultivate together, side by side. Rather than following the Buddha, in Buddhism we follow what the Buddha followed. How about that? The Buddha is there as a coach, as a guide to help us out, but we follow the Dharma. The Buddha is what happened when he cultivated his nature using the Dharma. Buddha is a title. So this is a human experience that we pick up. Okay, is this, I don't know, if people kind of, does this make sense? 
if I were Doug Powers, I would say, y'all follow so far, y'all y'all get this, y'all you understand? Everybody everybody get this. <laughs> y'all get that so much? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who's that? That's me. <laughs> Wearing my University of Michigan sweatshirt. Tom. And I've just been given my golf bag. I'm fifteen. And uh that's my dad. And that's as much as a smile as my dad ever gave. My dad was not a great guy for smiles. He's a big, tough Taurus, Scorpio moon. And what had happened, um, he was a golfer on the weekends. And my dad used to take me out. He would come home. He was a, a lawyer for a corporation. He argued contracts all day long with labor bosses and he just he would come home at night just like you see the steam coming out of his ears from all of the, the arguing that he'd been doing and he would I would watch dad and and he would go to his golf bag and he would say you want to go get some balls and I go yeah so I would go grab we had a plaid scotch plaid bag of uh duffer golf balls they had their cover was cut by you know, they were no longer playable, but you could still use them for practice. And I would grab the bag, and my dad would take either a pitching wedge or a nine iron or sometimes more. Sometimes he would take a two iron. And we, he and I would walk two blocks down to Ottawa Park, where the third fairway in green of an 18 coal golf course was. It was our civic golf course in the center of Toledo. And uh, he would, uh, he'd dump out the bag full of golf balls and toss me the empty bag and I would look at what club he had and I would run down the right distance. If it was a nine iron, I'd run about, you know, 40 feet. If it was a five iron, I'd go 100 yards. And he would start whacking and you could see every every time he swung, he was hitting some lawyer's head, you know, whack, you know, <laughs> working out his aggression. And I would chase after the golf ball, right? And I would grab him, put him back in the bag and put him back in the bag. And as long as my dad was hitting the ball, I would be out there shagging him. The, the, the sun would go down, the mosquitoes would come out, but I was bonding with my dad. As long as he was hitting golf balls, I was out there chasing him. And then after he was done, he'd say, you want to hit a few? And I'd go, yeah. He would correct my swing, and, and uh, then we'd go home, and he was like, he was, his pressure was off, you know. So um, we did this for, for years, and then, uh, at age 15, for my birthday, uh, I got a golf bag. And what that meant was I was now qualified to join my dad's foursome. And when he would go out and play 18 holes, he would take me along. And I would, he would be out there talking with his buddies, Jim and Bob, and I, I would be, you know, watching and listening. And it was a rite of passage. I joined the foursome, right? So there's a contemporary uh, rite of passage. And you can see how much joy the giver gets from a gift that is appreciated. I'm kind of speechless here, but my dad, oops, my dad is, is, heavy, is happy here. So that's, luckily my mom turned the camera around and got the picture of the giver as well as the receiver. So you can see the joy in giving. All right, there we go. Um, our time, let's see, it's time is up nine o'clock. And so tomorrow, from my point, we're going to continue with our, um, continue with our story of the flashback of how the sixth patriarch became um, who he became. And tomorrow night, we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the issue of boys and our situation now um, where young men are not given a road to, to adulthood and see what the Sixth Patriarch Sutra can teach us about uh, that situation. I wanted to share with everybody I mentioned at lunch today, David Rounds, this will be our song for tonight, it is a poem, not a song. David Rounds. 2013, five years ago, was here and uh, wrote this poem. And one beat 
short of still. Still means quiet. So it's just a little bit away from being quiet. Here we go. The white mist rises silently across the hemlocks. The thrush is awake, tuning her secret guitar. The owl glides in the shadows, sounding the unanswerable who. Change is slow along this river. Time is one beat short of still. Sweet river, my friend, in a hundred years, will your clear current babble in the morning? Will you hear the sound of the ancient chant? Will the Buddha still hold you in his hand? The white veil lifts from the face of the trees. The guardian hemlock, the fragrant firs, the battle-scarred trunks. In the dark birch grove, where the thrush hides as her song soars. Sweet bird, my friend, in a hundred years, will your granddaughter's daughter still sing in the morning? Will she hear the sound of the ancient chant? Will the Buddha still hold her in his hand? Change is slow along this river. Time is one beat short of still. Sweet bird, my friend, in a hundred years, will your granddaughter's daughter still sing in the morning? Will she hear the sound of the ancient chant? Will the Buddha still hold her in his hand? Change is slow along this river. Time is one beat short of still. The turtle spirit rests on the mountain. Even the mists do not know she is there. She hasn't forgotten who gave her her name. She's waiting to see him once more. Sweet spirit, my friend, in a hundred years, will you still be watching with your sleepy eyes? Will you hear the sound of the ancient chant? Will the Buddha still hold you in his hand? Change is slow along this river. Time is one beat short of still. Change is slow along this river. Time is one beat short of still. All right. Thank you, David, for that poem. Um, we have dedication of merit today. We, we didn't dedicate this morning. We can do it now. And if you don't have a songbook in front of you, you can look at the screen. But the important thing about dedication of merit is that we uh, use our minds. The idea is that our minds are very much like a broadcast tower. Think of a cell phone tower sending out in all directions from here atop Turtle Mountain. And we can s use that signal to broadcast goodness wherever and however we want to whomever we want to send it to. Um, in Catholicism, they call it 
petitionary prayer. In Judaism, they say, Tikkun Olam, we heal the world with our minds. So there's nowhere in space that my mind does not touch your mind. Think of that. Where is a, a fence in space? Can you find it? It doesn't exist, right? There are no fences between minds. So we'll use that connection and send out a wish for goodness. However you want to do it. It's your wish. Please make that now. Here we go. Three times and then bow to Master Hua. People are don't have to bow. This is voluntary. Good night, everybody. Good night.